so this little cartoon just talks about transformative learning. These birds transform themselves onto the ground because there's a buried telephone line that they're sitting on. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, so we're going to talk today about transformative learning and scholarship of teaching and learning from the perspective of a CASEL, the Carnegie Academy for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, had a conference this summer. They have one each summer. Um, but this summer, they specifically talked about transformative learning and the scholarship of teaching and learning. And I was just going to share with you some of the definitions they have for the scholarship of teaching and learning. and what some of the transformative learning um, concepts are. So this is the first thing I wanted somebody to read. I don't know if anybody's done this before. Can you read it out loud, Steve? I couldn't believe that I could actually understand what I was reading. The phenomenal power of the human mind. According to research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter be in the right place. The rest can be a total mess if you can still read it without problems, because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. Amazing, huh? Yeah, and I always thought spelling was important. <laughs> <laughs> That's really remarkable. So, <laughs> so talk about different ways of thinking and learning. You know, there's this is a, a clear... Can everybody do that, or am I just really talented? <laughs> Fast. <laughs> it does um, so. take longer. I mean, it was harder than reading regularly. Yeah, at first it was. I thought I got it. At first I didn't think I could do it. That's right. probably because you, you've got the framing notes. You know where it's going. And I think it's much harder. Yeah. An individual word on its own yeah. would be much harder to get than a sentence. And then as you're several sentences in, oh, I know where this, you know where this paragraph is going. Yeah. I know what to expect. But that also fits with the, not to ahead, really, no, but that also fits with the thesis, which is to say that um, framing matters. And so just as the letters are jumbled, now you put words in an order and the point is you're providing context over yeah, all sure. what's going on. Yeah, if you change the order of those words, boy, that it wasn't the same. Yeah, or yeah, that Mike, why don't you do that in French? Well Mike's yeah, better yeah, French yeah. than I am, but <laughs> you know. So it, it depends on your uh, decoding. Yep. So scholarship of teaching and learning, they talked about encompassing a broad set of practices that engage teachers, looking closely and critically at student work, and for the purpose specifically of improving the classes and programs. And I'm just going to go through these kind of quickly. Um, as far as I know, the term was coined by Ernest Boyer in the 1990 book, Scholarship Reconsidered, which was published by the Carnegie Foundation. And um, <coughs> there's been a lot of research since then that's fed into this. So SOTO brings together scholarly inquiry with the intellectual tasks that compromise the work of teaching. So designing your course, facilitating classroom activities, trying out new pedagogical ideas, advising students, which I think doesn't happen a lot. In engineering, when we ask students who their advisors are, it's the administrative assistant, it is not faculty. And writing student learning outcomes and evaluating the programs. So it's pretty all-encompassing. It's not so much a function of what the pedagogic use that faculty, or the pedagogies that faculty use, it concerns the thoughtfulness with which they put together their learning environments, attention that they pay to the students in their learning, which has to do with advising, for me, anyway, and engagement that they seek with colleagues on all things pertaining to education. And so I'm engaging with you, but I, I don't engage with the engineering folk about what I do because <laughs> they don't support it. They're very traditional lectures, so. I don't want to stir up the pond too much. Although they, they hear through the grapevine some of the stuff I do. So does all this pedagogical experimentation actually improve outcomes for students? And currently, it's a huge area of research. And obviously, some of you here have done a lot more than I have in this area. But um, so this area of scholarship doesn't solve all problems once and for all. The challenges of teaching and learning are very persistent. It's a human enterprise, so it's changing every semester. Um, the world is changing rapidly. The information content is so readily available that we need to think about what we're doing in the classroom. And the big concept that I got out of this summer was that we're really teaching how to learn. And there, there's content, but you're also teaching them how to learn with the content. There's a bias towards innovation for scholarship teaching and learning because inquiry naturally leads to changes in pedagogy, and then inquiry leads to further inquiry. So it's just bounding on itself, and there's a whole lot of literature out there now. 
assessing for improvement oriented towards discovering and understanding where the students have difficulties, which is different from just grading the test and saying, oh, they got 80% right, I'm happy. It's looking at the 20% and saying, why didn't they get this or where can we go with it? So this all fits into what they call New Think by Edward Bono. In 1967, he talked about perception, and he talked about perception as having the ability to see what is actually there, even if it's not what you expect. And we know from a lot of studies that students, if they expect something different, they'll remember it differently. So they won't remember the correct thing that you're showing them because they're so hardwired to not remember it. Um, so he suggests turning your attention to the world of possibilities, looking at rock, rock logic versus water logic, we'll have on the next slide. And his thinking has evolved into a corporation, and he takes creativity and um, scholarship of teaching and learning things to companies and businesses and, and schools and does presentations for them. And the debonogroup.com is his website. So knowledge, there's informational knowledge. And in engineering, we're really good at informational knowledge. It's directed, it's vertical, it's very rational, whereas transformative knowledge is much more free and lateral, integral, the rock versus water concept, glue versus grease, Convergent versus divergent. So in the transformative knowledge, you're letting students explore and find their own way, whereas in the informational knowledge, you converge onto a solution that's the right solution. So together, these two kinds of knowledge um, make a really great team. The informational knowledge, like I said, is very well used in engineering education. The transformative knowledge is underused and undervalued, without question. <laughs> um, and so the, the question to ask is, can we spend at least a few minutes of lecture time to create awareness and to help foster transformational knowledge? The, generally speaking, the faculty that I'm working with get upset if they figure out that they're going to miss one hour of lecture because it's a holiday. They're very stressed out. They don't know how they're going to get through all the material for the semester. So they're not really thinking about <laughs> teaching them about how to learn on their own, but that they have to give them all the information. So here's another out-of-the-box out thinking. Does anyone know what this frame game is? It's like if you had three pairs or something. So take a look at that and see if you can come up with something besides it, Susan. Well, well it's not the word it's. Right, it's not the word it's. it's. Do you know what it is? It's a black-eyed Susan. Eight. So it's a frame game, it's looking at the words differently. Black eyed Susan. Flower. <laughs> it's a flower. <laughs> so if you don't know that, it's a very hard frame game. Black eyed pea might have been easier. Okay. So we can't neglect one set of the tools to the benefit of the other. Um, it's not either or, it's both. And we're trying to start combining more of that in engineering. So what are some of the barriers to awareness of transformative knowledge? The web of mindset habits. Um, Claude Steele talks about it a lot in his book, Whistling Vivaldi, um, where he talks about, do I sit with my peers in, a, in the cafeteria, or do I sit with the people that are in my neighborhood? Um, and what, what does that cause either direction? Or he talks about, um, when he's walking down the street, that people avoid him. He's African American, and people will cross to the other side of the street. But when he's whistling Vivaldi, people don't do that. They recognize the tune, and they think, oh, well, this must be OK. He's educated, et cetera. Um, if you look at a cup, and you think about what's the shape of the cup, and what does a cup do, it's the empty space that really is the functionality of the cup. But we look at the cup and, as a whole and the handle. Um, Drugs are a symptom, not just a problem. So reframing problems and thinking about, you know, drugs are also a symptom that there are problems. So people are using drugs to avoid things. Um, with mindset habits, you're conditioned. You don't think, you just do. So there's a lot of that practice, that immediate response sort of thing. There's doors of doubt where you're not comfortable with looking outside of the box. The Black Eyed Susan was sort of frustrating for some of you to look at because <laughs> you didn't know what I wanted you to do with it. <laughs> um, 
and overcoming the rigidity of informational knowledge and, and loosening up to get into more of the transformational knowledge and working towards a scale of balance with this. So encoded language. Language is a learned arbitrary system of vocal symbols through which human beings interact in terms of their total culture. So it's a tool we use to make communication easier, but it's also a constraint in that if you can't, um, you did a beautiful presentation on pictures, pictorially the students coming up with a picture instead of words to describe a concept. And that's where you can really see the constraint of words versus being able to do a picture. Um, comedians <coughs> play with words. Most people really enjoy stand-up comedians because they're turning phrases all the time. So it's an interesting way to look at language. Um, colors are a big thing encoded in language. The Iteri in Africa, the tribe that lives in the rainforest, they don't see direct sunlight. They only see the canopied sunlight coming through the leaves. And so they have approximately 15 words for green, 15 words for gray, and 15 words for black because they see in shades of green, black, and, and gray. Um, and so, you know, there's, they have many more labels than we do for these colors. If you give a five-year-old a crayon box with 12 crayons, they're gonna be like, oh my God, this is awesome. Look at all these colors I have. Whereas you could give them a box of 144 and they'd be like totally blown away with all the colors. And if you think about it on the computer now, how many colors you can access when you're making PowerPoint presentations or whatever you're doing with color. Um, and the Arctic Induit have like 15 words for seeing white. So they can see all these different shades of white and what it means if there's a white out versus it's snowing gently versus the sunlight's out or it's dark at night. Um, and it's pretty amazing what they can distinguish as far as white goes, that we would we'd look at it and just see white and they can see all the different dimensions of it. So this is again just looking at language saying, Buffalo once roamed the plane in large numbers. So they're hanging out in large numbers. And I thought it was really appropriate since we're in Colorado and we have Buffalo. <laughs> so I'm gonna pick on you again, Steve. Have you done this one before? I have. Okay, so you can do it again. Uh, but you have to remind me what You have to say to as fast as you can the color of the words. Don't read the words, just say the color. Green, blue, I don't know what that color is. Red, purple, green, black, red, purple, You're good. blue. Okay, it's very good. It's hard to do that. <laughs> what word are we doing? Yeah, so I'm impressed. <laughs> going I was going, uh, oh, okay. going across this way. Yeah. And if you just look at it yourself and, and start doing it, you'll realize you real quickly turn into starting to say the words. So it, it helps that I didn't bring my glasses. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm struggling really hard to focus on these slides. I just relaxed. Anyway. Yeah, I didn't have to read the words. Didn't have to read the words to see the color. Okay, so Einstein said, words or language do not seem to play any role in my mechanism of thought. My elements of thought are images, which again goes back to, I think, what you were doing with your presentation. Um, and it's pretty powerful. He was so, wrong. He was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> wrong about quantum mechanics, he's wrong about language. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, somebody asked me about that. I was talking to them about this presentation. And they were like, isn't something faster than the speed of light now? And I'm like... I know. <laughs> There's been a lot of discussion. Yes, yes, no, 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 no. I just meant that, that statement. I mean, well, he, he was being, he was making a Yeah, he was making a point. Yeah. He wasn't, yeah. So Piaget and Dewey, from a historical perspective, Piaget was a biologist and a psychologist who was totally fascinated with children and how children developed. And Dewey was a philosopher. And through observation, they intuitively came extremely close, close to what we know of current brain scans through MRI and PET scans of what's happening in the brain when different activities are being done. Um, and there's a, so if you look up Piaget or Dewey's work, you can see a really strong correlation there with current data. Um, so a lot of the rest of this presentation ties into The Art of Changing the Brain by James Zoll. And Noah doesn't like that book. I, <laughs> are you looking I at I disagree. Well, it, yeah. Please. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. I, um, please. Okay. Sorry. Often we explain, teach, and then for no apparent reason, learning happens. And part of the scholarship of teaching and learning is trying to figure out how that learning happens and in why it happens. So learning is physical. We can't get inside and rewire the neurons and dendrites directly, but we can arrange for things to get rewired by the environment that we set up. Um, it's very hard to break down the misconceptions with those of you in physics I know who struggle with this very hard. The, the students come in with misperceptions and they're already hardwired. And to break that hardwiring, 
is much harder than teaching them a new concept that they haven't seen before. Um, so learning is a complex change. It changes ourselves. It's a physical process. And when you get students thinking about that, that while they're sitting in the classroom with you, their brains are changing. They're making new connections, and they're actually doing things. Um, our learning in any given subject is influenced by our experiences in total, everything that's in your brain. So just thinking about how all that works together. Learning is dynamic. It's the art of teaching is really the art of changing the brain and, and coming up with new ways of going about sharing things with students. Um, I think there is a revolution now that we're starting to know more about how the brain works. And I think neural nets were an early way that people were looking at trying to mimic um, what's happening in the brain. So Lee Shulman made up this one table of learning. He was the, is it president or director? President. Of the president of the Carnegie, um, the Carnegie Institute, Institute for Education. Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. And um, so he talked about the first thing you have to do is engage the students. And if you engage them, they're going to have motivation. And then if they have motivation, they're going to start developing some understanding, which leads to a complete knowledge. Um, the knowledge will turn into action, which has performance. And then they'll take the time to do reflection and higher order thinking, make some judgments in uncertain conditions, and a commitment to, to learning this knowledge and to working on this act, the study that you're trying to study. Threshold concepts are another concept that you're opening up a new and previously inaccessible way of thinking about something. Um, it's a transformed way of understanding, and at least to transform the internal view of the subject matter, subject landscape or worldview. And again, doing your pictures, I think, is a big part of that, um, looking at new things. Emotion. Emotion is extremely important in engaging students, and I don't think we think about that a whole lot. Um, we need to be looking at methods to make emotions a part of the meaning, and learning is best when it truly matters in a person life, person's life. When she really believes it's important, she's going to learn better. So there's extensive connections between the emotions in our brain, and the learning cycle is influenced and supported by emotion in looking at concrete experiences, active testing, abstract hypothesis and reflective observation. And so tying those in is very similar to Lee Shulman's um, elements in his learning cycle. And learning involves discovery and sometimes surprises, which can be really exciting and, and really tie you in emotionally to what you're doing. So I think when you're teaching, you need to be selling importance. You need to be giving the students the feeling that um, what they're doing is important and that they can understand it. I think you have to do reflection in order to really get that going with the students. And typically, we don't allow our students very much time to reflect on their work in engineering if we even let them reflect at all. <laughs> it's a very small portion of time. So with reflections, what we're asking students to do is identify all aspects of the problem. And so we want them to reflect on the problem. If you think about wheelchair access, wheelchair access was you know, the American with Disabilities Act all of a sudden we have curb cuts and all sorts of things for wheelchairs to get around. But it also aids people with strollers, right? People with babies that are pushing strollers now can get around on the curbs too. So there's a lot of things that we do for one reason and they have benefits in another place. Down syndrome people often are working in cafeterias. Well, that's very boring work to most of us, but it's very exciting work for them. So isn't that appropriate and aren't we glad to see that versus questioning what's going on? Um, Phone booths. What's happening with phone booths these days? They're going away. <laughs> Why is that a problem? It's part of our Superman. Superman. <laughs> <laughs> Superman. Superman. <laughs> um, what else might be a problem? Yeah, I was thinking you could just relay over the privacy booths and then uh, <laughs> do your, your cell phone. Cell phone. Yeah. But not everybody has cell phones. Yeah. Or your cell phone dies. Yeah, and everybody can hear everybody else's conversation. The phone booths are private. So it's, it's actually a... Um, socioeconomic issue because the poorer people, when they get somewhere, they don't have the ability to call anymore because there aren't phone booths being supported. Um, can anyone guess what a microwave paper towel would look like? What do paper towels look like? They're, they're rectangles. So what would you want for a microwave? Round. Why don't we have round paper towels for microwaves? 
And this gets into the whole made for TV, or made seen on TV, whatever the, the comment is. You know, to get you really thinking about things that are really obvious, but are not, um, you know, I mean, people are actually going crazy with the made for TV. They're kind of pretty loony stuff if you look at some of it, but. I don't um, know what you're referring to. It's seen on TV. It's seen on TV? DB7. There's things like, they sell. The thing is like a hard boiled egg, that'll make your hard boiled egg and take the shell off it for you so you don't have to deal with that. I mean, Sometimes. really, <laughs> sometimes you've tried it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of really interesting, ma you don't watch TV. I, I don't know what this is talking about. Okay. So it's just people coming up with all sorts of crazy inventions that they say on TV, this is made for TV, and then you want to go buy it. And it's a, basically a big Maybe commercial. Sold on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah me and so a guy with a British accent yelling at you. Yeah, I'm telling you, you want <laughs> this. <laughs> it's going to make but wait, you happy. There's more. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Double. And there's a new, I don't know if you guys yeah. saw the snugglies, those like sort of blankets that you put your Now they have something else that's actually a full body suit of fleece. But they're like, oh, you can wear these tailgating and you can do that. And it's, it's pretty crazy. I mean, I thought it was a joke when I first saw it. But <laughs> um, anyway, so reflecting on lots of different things can be important. We see things as we're conditioned to see things. We see them as we are, not as they are. So if we're talking about a child versus adult, who's going in and out of the house more often? Little kids are always running in and out of the house, but the screen door handle is way up high. They usually can't reach it. So why not have a handle lower so the child can get it open and closed without breaking the screen? Um, railings, kids tend to fall down the stairs. It'd be smart to have railings down at their level. And if you go into some homes, you'll see this. There'll be a double railing so that the kids, when they're going down the stairs, have a handle to hold on to. And hanging things up. You want your kids to hang things up, but the hooks are really high. That's not going to work. So it's just thinking about things from a different perspective. So being real to your students. Um, being able to make an emotional connection for a student and a teacher. And I realize for people that are teaching classes of 600, that's probably completely impossible. But my class is the highest one I've had is 75, so I've kind of been able to click in with most of the students. Um, and it's a real trick knowing when to lead and when to step aside. Um, that's a, a, a really challenging thing to do. So we talked about learning styles. Um, engaging students with their best learning style, their natural inclinations, and their engagement will be excited. And then you can start leading them down the path of looking at things with different learning styles and see if it can open up their minds a little bit. Pleasure in learning. So learning can be extremely exciting and feel good. And math is something that a lot of students <coughs> struggle with and get frustrated with and really hate. And then all of a sudden they get it. And it's just a phenomenal feeling. I don't know if those of you can sort of feel that way. In physics, I'm sure there's very similar aha moments where you're like, oh, I finally get it. This is so cool. So fun in learning. There, there was a study done where the kids played Jeopardy in, in like, so let's say in an electromagnetics class like I teach. They really enjoyed it, it was very competitive, and they were having a lot of fun. But the result was they only retained very isolated information. It reinforced what they knew, but there was almost no retention of new knowledge. So picking up on what, you know, on the Jeopardy game. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so. Really? Yeah. We, we had Jeopardy set up for redoing for midterms and finals. Ah. It, 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 work, it works. It works very well for that. Oh, does it doesn't. Okay. Right. Taking stuff that they ninety percent know. No. Right. And, and reinforcing it. Like a drill. So we change that. We do taboo instead, which pedagogically is much better because it makes them think about how to explain that. Taboo is where you have a term that you are trying to get your team to say a term, but you can't say there's a, there's oh, a, a, a handful of list of words that you can't say. <laughs> and so, like a taboo, we might say orbit. And then taboo words are circle, uh, planet, star. And so they've got to say, well, this is how. And so it makes them really think about it, how it works. It's a great term. Without using this term. Without using this term. So it makes them think about the concepts and other terms they can't without, right. without just parroting the language that they've already been told by the instructor. So have you written a taboo game for? Yes, for we have a whole set of astronomy taboo covers. Oh, that's sweet. Cool. That's really cool. That's really cool. Um, so the, the conclusion was they remembered what was important to them, and it wasn't the academic content, it was the game. They remembered who won the game. They remembered the competition that they'd actually had played Jeopardy in the class. Um, 
but it wasn't overly effective. Okay. So using stories is an, another piece of the, the getting into the stock of teaching and learning. Stories engage all parts of the brain. They come from our experience, memories, ideas, actions, and our feelings. They're verbs. They're, they're action-oriented. They focus on the good and bad. They generate fear and pleasure. They engage most parts of the brain, and that's when there's a lot of deep learning going on. It's pretty challenging to find stories in engineering sometimes to really get the students motivated and excited about stories. But you can talk about, for myself, I can talk about cell phones and antennas and, and radio telescopes and, and all sorts of things like that and, and try and tell them stories to get them excited. Um, so maybe the question is not how do you motivate your students, it's how can I support their learning. And if you're supporting their learning, hopefully they'll be self-motivated and really want to get involved in what they're doing. So, I can do this myself was another big theme. Making suggestions about what to do, reminding the learner, learner what she already knows, so working from their knowledge base, and allow some success, and the student needs to sense this movement. Emotions turns positive, she feels hope, interest increases, she gains confidence and pride and begins to think, I can do this myself. And I have an article that I'm gonna, I'll hand out at the end, because I know you just read it if I give it to you now, <laughs> um, that, that talks about problem-based learning and looking at sort of the whole problem-based, which I would call sort of a story. And that students don't recognize, um, this was a double E study, that the students don't recognize how much they learn in problem-based learning. So they tested them conceptually, and they were way ahead of their peers that were getting a traditional lecture, but they didn't perceive that they were further along. So, not invented here. This is a very old saying. Um, a leader is best when we hardly know if he exists. When his work is done, his aim is fulfilled, his followers will say, we did this ourselves. So looking at um, you know, the, the concept of, of turning over the control of the classroom a little bit to the students and letting them really feel like ownership of what they're doing. Thinking about that was hard. Getting the students to reflect then, why was it hard? What was so hard about it? How did I overcome it? How did I get through the problem? Um, undergraduate students typically make obvious errors to an experienced person, but then they get really excited to learn what they've misconceived. So, it, you know, you can share with them and it really increases it. So, these are some of the things that came out of distinguishing a teaching for change and transformation learning classroom from a traditional university course. Um, looking at collaborative, interactive work with the students and the teacher, <coughs> looking at authentic relationships between the teacher and the students, lots of energy in the room. I know when I do things, the energy in the room just, just rises up. It's very technology rich. There's, um, you've got your clickers, you've got the web. Um, you can do and redo opportunities, foster a community of learners and value the experiences outside of the classroom. So what does the classroom look like? It's going to be smaller. You're not going to have, if in the teaching for change and transformational learning, you're going to be looking at a much smaller classroom than a 600 seater. Um, there'll be flexible seating like this, so you can move around, you can work with people. Um, it'll be adaptive to a lot of different classes. The room will have really good acoustics, and it'll be a trusting, safe place, and a place where you can do inner reflection. So what are you as a teacher doing and saying and thinking in this interactive environment? You're looking at collaboration. You've got to let go of the traditional control a little bit and let there be some um, burning questions that you're looking at. You want to set up an open environment. You want to catch the students thinking and encourage them towards the concept that you're trying to teach them. Other skills, of course, content, presentations, teamwork, all the other things that you can be doing in a classroom besides just lecturing and content. Um, you're trying to ignite what's dormant, and you're trying to model experiences for the students so they can replicate what you're learning. So what are you doing as a student? Some get very annoyed and confused, and I talked about that with my talk. I had students that wanted their money back from being in my class because I didn't teach them enough. They learned the material, but I didn't teach it to them. And uh, they argue with each other. There's meaningful dialogue. They must be prepared to come to class because they're going to be talking to their peers and working with them. And if they're not prepared, their peers are not going to want to work with them. Um, they set up and make meaning among themselves as they're working together. You're the guide on the side, not the stage on the stage, was the 
phrase that was being thrown around a lot. Um, you're reflecting and assessing if it's valuable information if you're a student in this sort of environment. And so, what would you do to prepare to offer such a course at traditional you in the near future? You've got to risk failure because there's going to be kids that this is going to fail with because they're very they want the traditional lecture and that's where they're going to um, they're going to complain if they don't get it. Um, there needs to be a learning community like this, a safe place for students and teachers to share their um, their uh, things that are going on in the classroom. Establish ground rules for behavior. Connect to the class outside the classroom. Understand what the purpose of the class is. Incorporate the students into designing the course. If you don't go in the first day with a syllabus that tells them exactly how everything's going to be done in the course, but you go in the first day and talk about learning and what's going to go on in the classroom, and then um, have them help sort of develop how the class is going to be taught and do things. For a smaller classroom, um, you know, the students can get very engaged doing this. Learning outcomes beyond content and connecting the class to prior learning. I guess my last slide. Oh no, this is. So this says, I'm afraid I've thoroughly messed up the seating chart, so you must take care of remembering your new names. <laughs> so this would be a traditional <laughs> faculty. <laughs> so tying it all up, um, transformative knowledge is a resource, a tool we can use to enhance the learning and learning of students. Um, it's a complement to the informational knowledge. It's not better than informational knowledge, but it's definitely a complement to it. As teachers, we can give transformative knowledge value and legitimacy to the students, which they don't necessarily get in a lot of other places. You can't just do it once. You've got to embed it in the class, and it's a process that takes time to develop. And don't talk about it as a special, separate thing that we're doing, because that makes it awkward. You want to try and integrate it into the classroom as a whole. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Believe it or not, that was 50 slides. <laughs> so, uh, yes, Noah? Thank you, Melinda. I um, love hearing about these ideas sort of spreading around and, and, mm -hmm. and hearing different perspectives. And so, lots of different communities are working, and SOTL might be interesting for us to explore where the ends of SOTL begin and deeper be, uh, pick up if there is a distinction in these different communities. Um, well, let me jump in. And so that's one possible topic to chat about. Um, I haven't actually heard about informational knowledge or, uh, and transformational knowledge before. I've heard about different ontologies of knowledge. Uh -huh. um, uh, but those sure look familiar to us, though, didn't they? I mean, we have different words for them. Yeah. We do have some different words. So what I wanted to, I, I was wondering. Quantitative versus qualitative reasoning is what we would describe it as. Well, procedural, declarative. Actually, I would like, can you go back to the slide? I, so the, so the, so the, the, my question is, does this span the space of what, what it is that we advocate <laughs> or would want to advocate for in our classrooms? And what work does this do? I mean. So it, it does <coughs> point out some, maybe some things that we're not doing in our classrooms that we want to. I'm, I would be curious to consider whether or not this spans the space of everything that we do want to engage um, in our classrooms, or ways, even if it's not what we want to do in our classrooms, it's important for us to have uh, theories of knowledge that help us then in constructing what goes on in the classroom. So does it do that work for us? And, and what doesn't it do? I mean, my concern immediately for this is to say, I don't know that this covers everything I would want, and I'm a little bit concerned that what is informational knowledge for some is transformational for others, okay. that, that I think it may in fact depend on the students uh, tremendously, as well as the environments in which people are embedded. So um, anyway, I was just trying to think about the, the ontology of this <coughs> knowledge world and, um, uh, and see where it gets us, since I haven't seen so well, this spoke to me, Noah, because that, that right hand, excuse me for interrupting. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, that right hand column looks to me like, you know, this is, this is the ability to think qualitatively and, and especially the ability to generalize, to look beyond surface features to big picture items. And um, I, I'm yeah. trying to tell a story. Go uh, for it. <laughs> so uh, Saturday night, I played a pattern recognition game with a three-year-old boy, and I could not win. He won again and again. 
It was a simple. It was a. It was an array of 36 squares. It was a game of concentration. No, well, it was like it was like that. It was a game of 36 squares, and and under each square was a face, and you turn over the faces two at a time, and then turn uh -huh. back. And so you know, a little boy with a white hat uh -huh. and a red shirt, a little girl with uh, you know uh -huh. different different ethnic groups, and. And your job was to turn over the faces that matched, and as soon as you turned over the matched you. And again and again, that little three-year-old would, <laughs> would turn over the little black-haired boy, and he'd go right, I remember seeing that four, four turns ago, the little black-haired boy was here. And, and I'm just like, oh, man. <laughs> so this kid was effortlessly uh, remembering details. Uh -huh. While again and again, I could remember, yeah, I remember that was somewhere in the lower left hand corner. Uh -huh. And I realized that that ability to, uh, I, think, I think because I had become an expert learner, I, I've learned to ignore details and try and see past details to a big picture. And that, that sort of habit of mine is so ingrained. Maybe it's just because I'm getting older and I'm sure it's remembering this crap. But, <laughs> but, but here's a kid who who is so expert on details that uh, I think it's, I can't have a feeling it's part of conceptual maturity that your first, your, your, your point of view is detail oriented. Mm -hmm. And then a larger, when you, when you mature, you're able to um, synthesize details into a package mm -hmm. and, and organize details in a, in a different way. And once you organize the details so efficiently, the details actually becomes quite hard to hold the details because you put everything in a framework. The three-year-old, that's also sort of approaching peak language acquisition. Yeah, that's right. Facility. Exactly, exactly. Absorbing colossal amounts of information and subconsciously right. creating, creating the rules of grammar right. without ever articulating them and being, being able to speak. So let, let me just re reiterate my point in a different way. So I, I teach physics, and I try to get students to generalize. Uh, and uh, on, with some of the, and the only way I know how to do it is to model it. Okay. Well, let's do a concept test. Let's discuss it. Here's the kinds of things you should be looking for. Let's try another concept test, which will look different, but notice it's really the same underneath. And then on the exam, I'm going to give you another question <laughs> that will look different, but look for the big picture underneath. And, and I, I get at most 60% uh, getting it correct on the exam. So for some of the students I'm able, it works when I model generalization for them. They're able to see past the details. Right. It's not a question about a vote. It's a question about constant velocity. Uh, right. uh, but for 40% of the students, uh, they're they're bad. Bad. why is the generalized vote in the right hand column? We're generalizing an update now. So I'm, I'm you, you put in generalized in the right hand column. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But it's not up there. It's not up there. It's not up there. Right. But I, <laughs> I have a comment about this. When I look at this, um, when I think about my training, I look at sort of, okay, the information law, just the things that we sort of just absorb in the society and culture around us as we grow up. Like, people are homeless because they're drunk, so they're lazy. And, but we teach them to try to move into this more difficult way of thinking where we say, okay, well, look at the structure that exists above them. What's the economy? What's the government? Are there jobs? Is there low-income housing? We try to get them to think about the more complex or I don't want to see the complex picture. I just want the simple, stupid explanation, right? That must exist in most fields. <coughs> like we're saying, trying to buttress against these misconceptions. Oh, everybody's homeless because they're drunk, right? The idea of moving over here and saying, what are the symptoms? They're homeless. Is a, what's, the, what's the larger problem? problem yeah. What's going on? I've never seen the block and water turn before. Yeah, that's really interesting. Isaac is an interesting one. Yeah, solid or something. Yeah, solid is kind of great. It's not defined for me what transformative knowledge is because it's not directed. It's not rational. It's not something you can memorize. You don't have to know for it. So I can't understand. In contrast, to say Bloom's taxonomy is a nice hierarchy. And so it's very appealing because I can see these different levels. So my dad is a sociologist, and he worked on this with me. So that's where this is coming from. I'd say the, the, the rational one, though, could address a lot. You know, if we're looking for the underlying things, not a boat problem. It's really a constant, you know, velocity. Mm -hmm. uh, rational, I would think, might be a useful thing. And for that. Absolutely. You know, I mean, speaking as in a chemist, grease and water. I mean, those are totally, those are totally <laughs> rational. Polar polar molecules, not polar molecules. <laughs> So what 
is the mythic versus positive? Can, can you explain that dichotomy? Um, Just out of curiosity. No. <laughs> well, let me try. I, shit, please. I, I mean, the myth is is a story which uh, ha has powerful emotional impact, and there's a moral with uh, it. Positive thing is just a bit of information. Okay. Well, positive mm -hmm. also is something with truth value. That's right. That's right. Sure. But it it positive is, is yeah, to be true. it's a true bit of information. That's supposed to be. Right. But the myth, the myth is a powerful message, while positive is a small message. True, but small. Well, myths have some sort of human or cultural truth buried in them. Usually, yes. that's right. the ones that survive are the ones that that's are right. meaningful across many different spaces and cultures. <coughs> I mean, I actually like the list. I'm kind of trouble with the titles. I think it's something like constrained and constrained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's your first one. Directed and free, right? So you can make that your title. <laughs> Yeah, could you say something about the titles? So I understand informational knowledge. Uh, well, transformative knowledge is, at, what, that's what I was trying to um, get across to some of the little games that we played, the Black Eyed Susan, being able to look at something and, um, you know, look at it not for the content that you know is going to be there, but look for some other sort of meaning in the words. Um, a different frame of reference is the idea, right? You can, right. You can not just your one set frame, you see everything. Oh, you can think outside the box and look at it from another set angle. And gets a bit else out of it. Yeah. So have you been thinking about how we assess? <coughs> so there's been lots of thought about how you assess informational knowledge. Yes. And um, and how about assessing transformative knowledge? Um, I, I think that doing, um, well, you know, if I can't see uh, Black Eyed Susan, what, right. what does that mean? I hate grades. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, mean, I want. I yeah, yeah, no, I know. <coughs> but, but assessing, yeah, so I want to. I want to have some ability to decide whether I'm succeeding. Yeah. Well, there. I mean, there's outcomes that you're looking for. You're wanting to succeed at getting the problems done, but you're working with teammates on it, and it's it's not that. Well, I mean, in engineering, a lot of times the solution is right there, and in physics, the solu there is a solution, and it's the right solution. Um, but trying to, like, you, you know, go to the bigger concept from that, um, and I, I think testing in, this, in the sense of, you know, giving them different situations where they're looking at the same thing, um, and, and recognizing it or not recognizing it. Does the concept go in a new, in a new context? And can they, you know, yeah. can they carry across contexts? Right. Yes. So I have a question about that black eyed Susan thing. Why is it a T instead of a, is a, it a, a I, D? Okay. A D? I don't know. It was in the newspaper. Okay. <laughs> I would have known. So it threw me off. It threw you off, yeah. I. Black eyed. You're right. There's bold eyed Susan. There you go. That's <laughs> my. <laughs> I hate games like that. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I find them, I mean, I find them so totally non-compelling. Uh -huh. I see no purpose to do that. I, mean, I just don't right. like it. Right. But there's this idea that, you know, different people, the games work differently. Right. You know, some people are good at one thing, some good people are good at another thing. They're not all good at the same thing. Uh -huh. right. So somehow this misses that idea. And in a sense, what learning is supposed to be, in a way, is not is getting sort of people to a to a set place, rather than pretending that they're all going to become creative. I mean, most people will not be creative in more than one field. In fact, most scientists are rarely creative, except in more than one particular circumstance. Right. I mean, they get lucky; they find some cool thing, they get a reputation, and the rest of the you know, the rest of the time, they never discover anything interesting. Right. But can you be creative folks as well on the side? Or can create this is a limited they might be, great today might be, or they might not. But the question becomes the idea that creative is a general, is a general useful thing. thing. Yeah. No, not a useful thing, a general thing. Uh -huh. As opposed to a specific thing in a specific context with a specific motivation. Uh -huh. Like why do I want to do that game? 
I think the point of that game was not that you have to be good at that, but that one person will see I apostrophe T. No, 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 I mean, I realize that. So but why you, would I want to even try to do that? You, you so don't, but some people do. And so the point is that some people are seeing one thing and other people are seeing another thing. So this transformative knowledge means that many people, you can get to the same solution laterally, you get to it in many different paths. So that was just one, that was just the, one is path. Is there evidence that you get to the same mastery of the subject? Multiple paths, or I, that's what I'd like to know. Is there, is there evidence that you get to the same mastery? Well, I think that's the reference to things like problem-based learning. People do do better on uh, on assessments of conceptual understanding. Yeah, I think medical schools have decided um, empirically that that methods of teaching for pre-med, well, not pre-med, uh, students in med school, are, that the, the methodology is completely different now. Um, in many schools. Well, it's a very interesting distinction where, what you're talking about. So there's the methodology where you teach people to really be doctors or surgeons. Yes. And there's a methodology by which you teach them this material that, that you think they think they need to know to be doctors. So empathy So surgeons be. are taught by putting put in and doing surgeries. And Diagnosticians are taught. Yes, so before the that, medical course schools diagnosis. used to teach uh, material by lecture, and now and many of them teach with other other methodologies. No, no, so the question is, where is the real important learning in medical school occurring? Is it occurring in these lecture classes, which was what you're thinking about, or is it occurring when they're in the clinic? It's so both. It's it's all all you would know that because you've been in medical school. I mean, I, you know, I know, you know where doctors learn. Watching my wife is when they're in the clinic, when they're doing medicine. Yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. So, so, but anyway, so medical schools have made this choice. We could argue. No, no. About what, the question becomes: What choice have they made? They've so made what the have they changed? When are, have they changed clinical training, or have they trained changed this basic? You could roll your eyes. No, I can see it from I'm, here. I'm, I'm but ready. have they changed basic training that trains doctors as? The, the so skill they have of not eliminated the first year and a half. No, no, no they haven't. The school. question is, they've chosen not to do that. No, no, they haven't done that. So the, whether they know that that's reasonable or not, I know so they've they have a pretty. Election. All I was going to do was share some data. Right? Pardon? I was going to share some data. Okay. On on medical schools that drove um, PBL and and there's a, a fair amount of work with problem based learning and what it particularly helped do <coughs> was drive down um, the uh, failure or withdrawal rate. So it increased the retention rate um, for students in medical schools. Now, schools did that, I think, actually driven by financial reasons rather than, um, it, this is speculation, but what it did do, and so there was no evidence of competency or mastery, which is what you're after, um, Mike, which is a whole appropriate <coughs> dimension, but another dimension to look at um, uh, here is retention of students, which is what their goal was with PBL, at least several of them. So there's some great research on it's just, the way it's, on that. it's just an interesting question of when are people learning what? Right. right. Well, so remember, most place, of medical right? school, a lot of medical school students would see those first years of courses as completely irrelevant. All they want to know is what they're supposed to know on the test so they can get to do medicine. Because they're not doing medicine, the reason they studied all this time to go to medical school is to do medicine. And so there's an interesting, you know, problem-based learning may be because it's, it, it, you know, it seems less artificial. It's more like medicine, where you know we're trying to figure out what's wrong with this person. You know, so that so the question becomes, you know, wh where does the real learning occur that medical schools care about? I'm just worried about using. You know, oh, they change the way they teach these courses that are not really medicine, and that means something. But they haven't changed the way they yeah. train doctors when the you know when the rubber hits, hits the road. They still go work in clinics and do surgeries and do all. That's where they learn medicine. That's where they learn to be doctors. So the question, I mean, you could almost ask, could you eliminate, could you eliminate those courses altogether and affect their ability to be doctors? Do you want a GP who doesn't actually know any but what they learn it though, as they you know, know within, anatomy, within you said it, that for diagnos diagnosis. Uh, it depends on how you're being taught. Uh, I mean, you, you're not going to just spontaneously learn anatomy unless there's reason to do so. 
And uh, yeah. so, so you, you tend not to learn anatomy if you're just shadowing a doctor. Um, I think you can say you have, you have the motivation to learn because you're in there and you say, oh, I need to know this because I actually see the surgery being done. So I also need some language to communicate. I mean, a situation. Some people skills too, and that, all that stuff. I mean, the argument is both, right? I don't know if you're going to argue dentists shouldn't know the stuff or how to interact with us. <laughs> and empathy is a big thing right now in med school, is, is mm -hmm. that they're working on with students. It is 401. Anyone who feels it needs to be somewhere else. Thank you. If you'd like a copy of this, it's just a short clip on problem based learning.